Hey guys, it's Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today we've got Trading Technologies back, and they're here to talk about the brand new platform, Next Trader. So from Trading Technologies, we have Stephanie, Patrick, John, and Andrew, and some of the bullet points that they plan to cover today uh, include what exactly is Next Trader, uh, what's new, why do you want it, what's different. They're going to talk about the architecture and ecosystem some of the performance advantages, the uh, server-side technology, and some of the features like a mobile or web interface. As you guys have questions, you can type them into the uh, questions box, and we'll do our best to get everybody's questions answered here today. The webinar is being recorded like always, and I'll post it later today on YouTube. If you are watching the recording at a later date, do me a favor and give it a thumbs up if you like it. All right. With that in mind, I'm going to turn things over to the guys at TT and ask them to go ahead and uh, introduce themselves. Hi, Mike. Can you hear us? We can hear you. Hi, great. This is um, Stephanie Sandow. I'm a product manager here at TT. Uh, in the room is uh, Patrick Rooney, John Yu, Andrew Reynolds. We're all product managers at TT handling different parts of the um, platform um, that we're going to talk about today. The first thing I want to talk to you about is, uh, oh, and also just, I don't know if Mike already uh, said this, but feel free to ask questions, you know, as they come up. If it gets too chaotic, we'll, um, uh, you know, kind of take them in bunches. Um, the first thing I want to touch on is why are we building this new platform? Um, part of it stems from the fact that TT is celebrating their 20th anniversary this year, and we've um, got a platform that's practically that old, and with that comes um, some limitations in terms of how quickly we can do things and how effectively and efficiently we can make changes to that. So when we um, recently uh, got a new CT CEO, Rick Lane, he was thinking about how can we um, effectively make changes that will allow us to react more quickly in the future. And one of those things was let's, let's see what we can do with um, starting fresh, with writing new code. So this platform is really less about the front end. It's, even though we have some interesting things to talk about about the front end, it's really about the back end and the fact that it's all new and, and fresh, um, which will allow us to make these changes much, quick, much more quickly, allow us to try new things, and uh, be a little and be a lot more reactive to changing business needs that you all have. Um, so, with that said, what is the, what is the um, what is it that we're looking at? Basically, we're looking at a, um, this is our hold on a second. This is our this is basically the conceptual diagram of how this works. Um, this is from a video on our website, which you can check out at. Um, I don't know if you can see the website up there, um, but it's on our initiatives page. And what we've done is basically create a bunch of different pieces of this puzzle that sit either in the cloud or in the co-location facilities. And certain things that we use leverage the cloud for are um, things that require less speed and agility. And things that require all that speed is, are co-located, things like the algo servers and the um, spread engines. And then we can use the cloud for more historical data like audit trail and product data. Uh, what this does is it really leverages the um, cheaper and uh, kind of more uh, robust cloud technology and then allows the stuff that really needs the speed at the metal to metal facilities. So you might want to take a look at this video if you haven't seen it already. Um, it, it really gives a high overview of what we're trying to do. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, not so far. Uh, okay, great. The one of the main premises of this is that it's it's web-based. Obviously, this is a new this is new for TT. It's uh, it's you know something that we felt was important to bring to the people because it require it it allowed us to do things like the different front ends. So right now, I'm actually running this on a Mac wirelessly. Um, you can't see that, but uh, we're here in a conference room. And I also have an uh, Android phone that we, we run the uh, front end on as well. 
um, it, you'll see here on the screen I have, I've logged in and I have all these workspaces. What this allows me to do is log in from anywhere and then I'm always going to see these workspaces. So I've set one up here for Big Mike's um, forum and I have these other ones, uh, you know, I have a big screen at work or a laptop or a multi-monitor setup. I can, I can actually make these workspaces fit wherever I think I'm going to use the app. And then when I need another one, I just create another one. If I'm at a, a hotel business center or something like that, I can make a new workspace. Um, sorry, I'm just going to get to the, let's go small to get to the other one. I'm going to, I'm going to click on that, but I've already, I've already kind of done it, so I'm cheating here a little bit, but I'm opening the other, the other workspace. So this is a, is a next trader workspace. Um, for those of you who are familiar with XTrader, there's a lot of similarities. We have a, a um, MD, MD Trader, which is the ladder. We have an audit trail. We have a whole bunch of tools here that you might be familiar with, order book, um, market grid, time of sales, things like that. One of the main differences between NextTrader and our XTrader product is the way you get to find things. Um, and the, uh, let me go back for one. And the other main difference about it is that the, each of these components is kind of um, encapsulated code. So when we want to change something, say, on an MD Trader, we can, because it's all new code that I mentioned earlier, we can hit, you know, we can go in and change something there really quickly without having to uh, tweak or get into the code on other pieces, which in the um, X Trader we you know, built on top of things and top of things so that we have a less, um, on, on this platform it's going to be, it's already proving itself to be a little bit more um, flexible because of this encapsulated code uh, system that we've set up. Now I'll go back to the search. Uh, one of the things that's a lot different here is the, the way you find uh, products that you want to trade. I've just searched here for ES. You can see the front month contracts come up, and then from there I can open whatever I want, an MD Trader, an order ticket. This is very different from the current way that you do things in most trading platforms where you search for the uh, exchange, and then you dig in and you say the product, and then you dig in and find the expiry. This is a kind of a more natural way of going about finding, you know, a specific, like a needle in a haystack, a specific thing that you want to trade from a myriad of options. Um, the other nice thing about this is not only do I have to know the symbol, but if I want to find corn, I can type in corn or I can type in copper. It's, uh, you know, we felt like people are really becoming used to the way that, uh, you know, Google works or typical search engines work, and this was a more natural way to go about finding those, uh, finding the things that you want. Of course, if you don't see it there in the list, there's always a way to find something that you would want. Uh, the MD traders are very similar to what we have in XTrader. Um, they, you know, they have all your kind of setup and configuration pane stuff on the right, your quantity, your price column. You can move things around as you want um, and, and set them how you like. You can save room on your screen. Because this is portable now, you can use it from the web. If you find that you don't have enough room, you can collapse these side panels and make it a little smaller, um, which is, a, you know, we had to think about these things in designing this because of the various ways that people are going to be accessing it. We also created this tab feature where I can add another symbol to this MD Trader here and keep track of it on this tab. Um, so that if I don't have a lot of screen real estate, I can really keep it compact. <clears throat> um, another uh, interesting thing about this is the audit trail. When you, oops, sorry, let me send you that. When you um, put an order into the MD Trader and it gets filled, Watch the audit trail down here. It automatically pops in at the top. What we're doing with leveraging the cloud allows us to keep this audit trail populated from the beginning of time from your, of your account. So if you started your account three years ago 
uh, this audit trail is basically what we're calling a forever audit trail. You can go back to day one and search for any you know trades that you made on Tuesdays or however you want to find it. We're, we don't have that functionality built just yet, but it's coming soon. It's going to be a robust um, search, a robust query tool for that audit trail. And by using the cloud, it really allows us to do that. Whereas today on our XTrader project, you have to download logs and and um, you know, unpack them and see what's going on in there. One of the nice things about this as well is um, that it really will allow you to uh, look at business analytics. So you can use this tool for you know, looking forward to what you plan to do just based on the history, and it'll be right at your fingertips. Um, some of the other functionality that we have in here is, as I mentioned, the order book, positions, time of sales. Uh, fills and all that, but one of the things that we're really proud of and taking to a new level here is the um, auto spreader. Uh, I'm going to let John talk about that because we have some new features in this that are quite different from what we have now and pretty different from what you see in the marketplace today. So if there's any questions so far on what we've talked about, let me know. Okay. We got one question from RJ. He's asking if there is a uh uh, any price volume or like a volume profile histogram or anything like that for the dome? Uh, yeah, we'll add standard VAP in time to uh, to the MV Trader and then build, build from there, but not, and not in its current state, but by the time we roll it out, we'll have a uh, volume and price configuration in the MV Trader. Okay. And Luis asking kind of a generic question about speed. He says, you know, he's using another platform right now and he has a, I think he's saying he has a fast uh, or low latency connection to the CME servers. He wants to know how this would work with NextTrader. So, can you just give us like a high-level overview? So, you have your your different FCMs or whatnot. Are they still operating their own gateways, or is that different with NextTrader? How does all that work? Well, we're going to differ quite a bit there because this is going to be a pure ASP model, which means we're going to manage all of the servers, all of everything, on okay. behalf of the FCMs. And on top of that, with this new infrastructure, we're going to be co-located. Okay. Basically, global all over the place. So essentially, we'll be going straight to Aurora as opposed to going to any other stop-off point and things like that. So yeah, we in our early tests have proved to be a good deal faster than what we have in the Seven X platform of Xtrader right now. Okay. And one last quick question from cool. Chuck. Sorry, uh, that's a good point though. Is is Nextrader replacing Xtrader? Is Xtrader going away? In 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 time. <laughs> but not, not not in the not in the very near future. We know okay. that X Trader Seven X will be around for quite some quite some time. But yeah. Okay. The, the goal is in a few years, but not any time in the very immediate sure. future. Sure. Sure. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Did you want to add something? Oh no, that's okay. And one thing that I'll just add about you know you asked about volume at price. We are building this in a kind of very um, stratified way. We're starting with you know minimal functionality, kind of basic functionality, and, and what we're really looking for is feedback from our users. So once we you know get this into beta, which is coming up soon, uh, you know we'll get feedback on must-have features, and you know eventually we'll bring it up to parity with um, X Trader. It's just a matter of time. So what you see here now is kind of you know the first slice of functionality that we have built, um, and it, it's not the whole plethora of things available in Xtrader. Yeah, and this is Pat, Patrick again. Going, going back to the fact that it's a new system and the, and the speed question, you have to remember too, like Stephanie intoned early on, that the 7X line has been around for eight years now. So the fact that we started this from the very ground level and we wrote the code from scratch, we were able to eliminate a great deal of redundancy and issues that really caused any type of lagginess that ever would occur in the 7X line, not that we're lagging in 7X, but again, it's, it's a much more refined piece of code, so we do have a good deal of speed enhancements based off that, and we picked up a lot of features that we have in the 7X line kind of for free with an X-Trader, like multi functionality and some other things that we took years and years and years to build in the 7X line, we now have basically for free because we knew it, we knew what we were doing from the get-go. Right, right. Essentially with the next trader. Okay. Okay, so John's going to talk about the uh, auto spreader. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is John Yu. I'm the product manager for automated trading products, which includes the auto spreader. 
And uh, I'm going to start off with a note on performance to add to what Patrick just said about performance. I realize that performance is an important issue for uh, spreaders. So to show you that TT is serious about being uh, performant and being transparent about performance, we're going to add uh, performance figures, uh, latency figures directly to the auto trail. And you can see that down here, actually, uh, there is already a column labeled H latency. And it is going to give you the um, latency calculated for basically TT in and TT out time for your hedge orders. Um, this will be the beginning of many other uh, uh, latency figures to come. And again, my point is that uh, TT will, it aims to be uh, transparent about its latency figures. Um, just one second, actually. I'm just going to make sure we get a screen feed. Actually. Here. So we've taken a quite a bit of different approach with uh, Autospeder. Um, Autospeder will now go uh, hand in hand with another product called the Rule Builder. Uh, we'll still offer Autospeder as you uh, for those uh, 7x users. Uh, in its very much uh, similar form, uh, but the Rule Builder product will allow you to design your own features and add them to spreads of your choice. Um, for this demonstration purpose, I'm going to uh, build a very simple spreading strategy, and I have set up the ladder. Uh, I have set up the spread as follows. Uh, my spread consists of two legs. You can see that my first leg is uh, the June 14 leg. And second is the E-mini's SEP14 leg. And this is my synthetic spread ladder. Uh, there's, uh, this is just a simple one-by-one one spread. But my spreading strategy will consist of, uh, I will only want to quote in the June 14 leg as long as the bid is strong in the SEP14 leg. Uh, to be more specific, I will only quote in the June 14 leg when the bid quantity in the SEP14 is twice as big as the offer. And I'm going to achieve this by uh, designing my own set of rules and adding them to the spread. And once I am filled in the uh, June 14 leg, I am not going to hedge in directly into the bid, but I am going to um, offer one tick higher than the bid in an attempt to squeeze one tick out of the set 14 leg. And moreover, I'm automatically going to apply um, a governing logic to that cover order such that the cover order monitors the bid quantity. And if the bid quantity drops below a certain threshold, the cover order will move down into the bid to pay up. So let's go ahead and look at the, uh, the spread definition first. Uh, this window should look very familiar to Autospreader users. Um, you name your spread, and you get to define your spread formula. And of course, you can type your custom spread formula as you desire. And uh, the right side panel is a preview ladder of the spread that you have configured. And you use this button called Add Leg to le add le legs um, as such. And they appear as columns. And uh, these are the pr each row represents a parameter that pertains to each leg that comprises the spread. Uh, the only difference that you might, uh, for users of 7x orders better, the only difference might you have noticed uh, so far is the fact that uh, we have streamlined a lot of uh, canned features. Um, instead of offering canned features, we are now allowing you to build rules. And you're going to use this uh, drop-down menu uh, called Add Rule, which will expose a list of all the rules that you have made yourself. These are rules that I have made and named myself. And once you actually add a rule, they appear as a row, just like so and you're going to uh, check and uncheck to apply or deapply the rule to individual legs that comprise the spread. So to achieve the uh, spreading strategy that I have described, I have added two rules so far. Let's go ahead and uh, take a look at one of the rules in detail. To examine the details of a rule, you use another GUI called the Rule Builder GUI.
This is the Rule Builder GUI, and it has a vertical uh, top-down workflow fat pattern. Um, I give you three types of rules in the Rule Builder. You have a pre-quote rule that can be used to modify quoting orders of your spread. Then you have pre-hedge rules that can be used to modify hedge orders before they are sent into the market. And you have post-hedge rules that are used to modify hedge orders after they have been added and they're resting in the market. You can see that this rule is a pre-quote rule. And the detailed, detailed description reads, and this is the description that I have given it. It reads, suppress quoting in leg one if bid is weak in leg two. And each rule will take the form of if some condition is true, then take some action. And uh, you depict your condition using logic expressions, just like so. And to help you build these expressions, uh, IntelliSense actually presides over the expression field so that the rule builder language, so to say, is very much discoverable. And uh, you will um, you'll declare an expression just like so. And you can see that the expression that I have defined here uh, reads, um, the bid quantity in leg two, and remember leg two is the set 14 leg in my spread. The bid quantity divided by the ask quantity, again, it is just the ratio between the bid and the ask. If that is less than, if that is less than a custom variable called threshold. And threshold is a custom variable that I have declared, and you get to review all your uh, custom variables down here in the force panel. And threshold is just a, a, a numeric variable that I have declared, and its current value is 2. So qualitatively speaking, my logic expression says if the bid is uh, less than twice as big as the ask, then um, I want to take an action. And uh, the action reads, set the quote order quantity to zero. And this is another way of saying, telling the engine to suppress the quoting order. And uh, uh, all of these rules, the, the pre-quote rule is actually evaluated after the native engine itself has calculated where, where it wants to place the quoting order and the quantity with which it wants to place the quoting order. So just imagine without any rule, the stock engine behaves uh, just like a spreader, as you would expect. But after it has done its own calculation, it evaluates your pre-quote rules. And if some of the conditions in the pre-quote rules evaluate to true, then it's going to honor your action. In this case, I am telling the engine, regardless of your uh, natively computed quote order quantity, I want you to override it to zero and suppress it, basically. So I have made this pre-quote rule. And if I go back into the spread definition, I can add that rule. And I have added it uh, right here. And it appears as a row. And let's go ahead and see this rule in action. Right now, you can see that if you look at leg two, the SEP 14 leg, the bid is not twice as strong as the offer. So you can see that I have submitted a spread instance. And it's not quoting in the June 14 leg because the bid is weak. I'm going to manipulate the market to make the bid strong in the SEP 14 leg. To be exact, it has to be twice as big as the offer. And you can see 194 is greater than twice uh, as 79. And you can see that uh, now it starts to quote in uh, June 14 leg. And if, if the uh, if the bid becomes weak again, it will actually uh, suppress the quoting order in June 14 leg. And if the bid becomes strong again, it has to be twice as big. Yeah, you can see the rule in action, and it starts to quote in leg one. So that's the first part of my rule. And my second part um, is if I get filled in the June 14 leg, I don't want to hedge into the bid, but send, send the hedge order one tick above uh, the, the bid, bid, bid price that I am leaning on. And I can do so. I can either build a rule to do this, 
or I can actually use a canned feature that we still offer you. There's one feature that we still offer called pay up text. And for uh, leg two, I've just set it as negative one, which just means offset the, um, the destination hedge price by one tick away from the market. And let's see that in action. So let me just make a bid twice as strong. I'm quoting here. I'm going to induce a fill. Well, I just got filled, and you can see the hedge order went into the market one tick above the best bid price. So now that brings us, us to the last part of the rule, which is after the hedge order has been added to the market, I want to automatically apply a governing logic such that the hedge order is monitoring the bid quantity below it. And if the bid quantity dwindles below a certain threshold, that I want the hedge order to uh, move down to pay up into the bid. And I have designed that rule as a post hedge rule. And you can see the rule type is post hedge. And this time I've, I've, um, I was a little bit fancy with the language of the rule just to show you that the language of rule builder can be very precise. Um, and of course, it's discoverable using IntelliSense. So this this uh, particular condition is actually getting the bid quantity at a very particular price. And you can see the parentheses here and here. So I'm fetching the bid quantity at a certain price, and that price is um, where was my initial hedge order price? Where was the price to which I initially sent the hedge order? And then I want to minus one tick from that hedge order. So looking at the latter, if I initially sent my hedge order here at 1877 quarters, then I want to look one tick below that and, the, and get the bid quantity there, which currently reads 100. Right? So if that bid quantity, which is 100, is less than, this is a custom variable that I have created called puke threshold. And if that is less than the puke threshold, and Right now, puke threshold, I've set it at 150. So if that bid quantity drops below 150, then I'm telling the engine to take a certain action, and the action reads, set the hedge order price to wherever it sent the initial hedge order price to, minus one tick. So again, looking at the set 14 leg, if I sent it initially to 1877 quarters, then if this rule triggers, then I want the engine to move it down to 87, 1877 even. And um, I have already applied the rule uh, using the method that I have demonstrated previously to this spread definition. And let's go ahead and see the last part of my strategy in action. The bid, again, is not twice as strong, so it's suppressing the quoting in leg one. Now bid is twice as strong, and I'm quoting in um, the June leg. Let's get filled, and you can see the hedge order is now working one tick above the best bid price. And remember, my puke threshold is 150. So if the bid quantity starts to dwindle, it doesn't matter, right? It's, we're still above 150, but as soon as it dips below 150, you can see that the uh, hedge order actually puked into the bid. Uh, I know so because there was a black flag here that indicates that there was a, a spread, a child order pertaining to my, my spread instance working at this price. And it just actually uh, paid up into the bid because the bid quantity dropped below 150, which is my threshold. So that completes the demo of the, um, the spreader and the rule builder. And I just want to also mention that all of the rules that I have demonstrated were built from the perspective of buying the spread. However, you will be able to use a feature called flip for sell functionality such that um, even though you design one rule from a buying perspective, uh, you get to actually designate certain parts of the rule to flip when you're selling the spread. Okay, so that completes the uh, demo of the spreader and the spreader. Um, and before we move on, Mike, do I have any questions? Yeah, let's see. Uh, if anybody has questions for the spreader, go ahead and type it now. Thank you, John. Um, I don't see any just yet. We'll give it a second. I see some questions about ADL. I guess that's coming up. 
Actually, uh, uh, I won't be demoing ADL today, but I will be happy to uh, field questions regarding ADL. Okay, so let's just start kind of high level. So ADL is still going to be part of NextTrader? Yes. Okay. And do we have the same type of interface like what we'd have in NextTrader, or, or is it uh, – change significantly or what I mean what what are the plans any can you walk us through any upgrades or what you have changed about ADL sure um, basically uh, the all of the features that are present in ADL will be carried over to next trader um, but in addition to that we are adding um, flexibility to the product by allowing you to um, basically handwrite ADL algos using what we call TTSDK um, this is, uh, this is a, a C-based API product that is also going to uh, sit on the same engine that ADL runs on. Um, so what that actually means is that um, you have the option of building ADL using the same front-end interface that uh, you're used to using today in the 7x ADL. But in addition to that, you'll be able to basically handwrite ADL algos and deploy them to the algo server and launch them and take advantage of all the um, integration with um, XTrader. For example, you will be able to handwrite um, ADL algos, deploy them to algo server, see the um, algo orders uh, working on the algo dashboard, and um, launch them as if they're OTAs and all the uh, great functionality that you enjoy currently in XTrader. Okay. And let's see, Sean is asking if we still need the Algo SC or ASC servers like we do now, or is that going to be managed on the TT side? That is going to be uh, managed on the TT side. And this relates back to the uh, question of um, uh, hosting. Uh, and I just wanted to add to our previous answer that we do realize that um, F FCMs uh, distinguish themselves um, via a lot of uh, hosting techniques that they consider to be proprietary. And we are aware of this fact, and um, details are yet to be determined. But we are thinking of ways to offer the um, flexibility for FCMs to, to differ differentiate themselves in terms of hosting techniques. Right, right. Okay, let's see. Michael asking about the API. He says, I understand it's completely new, but at what point uh, will that be available for developers to start migrating their existing code? Um. <clears throat> What we're, doing, what we're doing at present is we're, we're working out the final details. Um, and if you want to sign up for the beta program, um, we actually have a, a uh, segment on our website where you can, uh, you can ask to be part of the beta program. We're hoping to start that program out within the next, uh, within the next couple of months. Um, the API has been written, rewritten from the ground up. The current TT API is actually, is actually a .NET API written for Windows. Um, the new API that we're writing for NextTrader is written in C and it runs on Linux. So obviously there's an operating system incompatibility um, with the with the existing TT API. So the your existing code will not will not be transferable in that sense. However, the new API has been rewritten from the ground up, which should provide additional uh, additional reductions in latency. Um, in addition, as John mentioned, the Right now, if you wanted to colo your your particular TT API application, um, you would have to hand copy that 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 algo out to the server, whatever server you may have. Um, in the new realm, um, you'll be able to deploy your algos directly to our co-located servers um, using the desktop uh, the desktop dashboard and deploy them in the same way that you deploy ADL algos. Um, so, in in the new system, an algo is an algo is an algo. Um, it doesn't matter whether whether it's written using ADL or hand-coded with TTSDK, um, all of these things have the same operational characteristics once they've been written. Okay, very good. And, you know, I, I've i looked at ADL for a while myself, and, um, I mean, I'm sure you guys know better than me that it's kind of a unique uh, situation that you guys are in with what you've done with ADL on the server-side uh, deployment. Is there, was there anything that you tried to change, you know, other than just improving latency? Was there anything that you tried to address about the, like, version 1 ADL? I mean, would you call this version 2, or is it pretty much the same functionality and features just on a, a new, you know, C language instead of .NET focused on performance? I think that um, we've learned, learned a great deal from uh, 7x ADL, and definitely... Um, 
uh, we are taking lessons from 7x and uh, reflecting the feedback of our users. And uh, uh, not just in terms of uh, latency, but um, uh, we are devising ways to um, increase flexibility. And one of the uh, long-term plans is to um, bridge the gap between such uh, uh, handwritten algos and um, GUI-written algos, so to say. And uh, there are many ways to go about this, but um, I have entertained the idea of a custom code block, perhaps being a possibility in the future to bridge the gap. Um, this is just an example of uh, many ways that I am devising ways to increase the flexibility of the product in general. Okay, great. Okay. I have questions uh, just about the mobile interface. Well, first of all, let me ask, was there anything else that you guys wanted to show us or you want to open it up just to general q and I think, I think we can go to general Q&A. Okay. Um, Okay. All right, guys. So you can type any other questions you've got. So I have one of my own. So you, I think this is all uh, based on HTML5 for the for the mobile side, right? So is there any specific uh, app that I need for iOS or Android or just a web browser? Yeah, actually, the um, right now it's actually an app. It's not HTML5. Okay. It's a, it's a native app for the Android phone. Okay. An iOS app is coming as well. Okay. Great. And on the desktop side, I mean, you're running it inside of Chrome, so uh, I'm assuming that is HTML5, or is there is there any plan to do like an actual Windows binary, or is there any need to just use the web? At, at this point, we're, we're focusing on the web, but the beauty of the platform really is, is not the front-end interface, it's the back-end components, right? So we may, you know, as demand, as we see demand and the need and the way our users are using it, we may actually end up with a, a bunch of different kinds of front-ends, you know? So it's not out of the realm of possibility, but right. now we're focusing on the web-based path. The, the front end of the back end is separated by, by a series of web services. The, the back end offers up a whole series of web services which you can take advantage of with HTML5 or you can write with native through native applications. Um, we have yet to explore all of the different ways that we can take advantage of this and it will certainly be driven based on our on customer demand. Okay. Uh, is there any requirement for Java? No. No. Okay, so no I... Okay, so this would work just fine. Whoops, we got your screen. There we go. <laughs> so this is going to work on Windows, on Mac, um, Linux. Doesn't matter, right? Correct. Okay. At this point, we, we are um, focusing our testing on Chrome, uh, right. the Chrome browser, but eventually will be all the modern browsers. Will be okay. Um, I've got a question here from Mike. He says, how much is it? <laughs> TBD. Yeah, pricing hasn't been finalized on it yet. We're still working through that model, but we certainly expect it to come in line with uh, the current x pricing program. Okay. Do you guys, you guys have like your own support forum, right? Do you guys offer code snippets or help for people that want to design spread strategies and ADL code? How does Absolutely. that work? Absolutely. I, I actually happen to manage or help manage the uh, Trade Technologies Twitter account, and I've been tweeting out links that are hosted in our users forum where some of our internal developers have actually put code out there in ADL to show how to create some advanced order functionality. Okay. In addition, we will have code functionality available through the um, code, code samples available uh, when the when the API is released to beta. Right. Um, currently, we, we do have a whole series of code samples that are available for the TT API. Um, in the same light, we will have the same kinds of samples available okay. um, through for, for the new API. Okay. So, you know, a couple day, uh, either yesterday or two days ago, I don't remember, I, uh, I started a poll on the forum just asking about uh, kind of like a local-based client versus a cloud-based or colo-based, you know, software as a service, platform, platform as a service. And, um, you know, a lot of the questions have started or kind of focused on security. So I thought it might be really good for you guys to talk about you know, the importance of security and what you guys are doing to, you know, protect my code and to pre protect all the uh, the information since it's going to be on the cloud. There's, there's a couple things we're doing. One is you have, to, you have to differentiate what we're using the cloud for and what we're using the Internet for. The cloud is really primarily there for 
things that aren't latency sensitive, like the audit trail. And that's one of the questions we have had from from some shops here in town already is about how we're expecting that. It's it's key to important that when you log into Next Trader, you you are you are given a unique token at that login. And as you log out, that token expires, and it's of no use to you anymore. It's no use to anybody. So no one can really go back into there and just jump right in. Secondly, with data going back and forth to the cloud, as it goes up to the cloud, as you're executing trades, it's going to be encrypted. When it gets up there, it's going to be it's it's obviously encrypted in the cloud as well. Then bring it back down, it's encrypted. But even while it's up there, when it comes back down, even TT can't access that data. That data is going to have a unique identifier to it as well, too, that the end user actually would have to unencrypt that data and give it to us, to TT, if we had to troubleshoot a uh, certain issue for them that involved their data. So okay. it's we're, we're highly security sensitive about that, so we're doing everything imaginable to make sure that everyone's data is kept completely unique and completely in their own, okay. their own realm. So... So sorry. Basically, sorry, the, the terminology is in transit and then at rest. So even while it's resting in Amazon, if someone should steal a server from Amazon, which mm. probably will never happen, they can't even get the data off of that server. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. All right, uh, let's see if there's any other questions. Uh, Mike is asking, he says he trades the, the S&Ps from Brazil and he's running his dome local. Uh, sometimes, or oftentimes, he says the bid and ask gets crossed. Uh, is this going to offer any better performance for his case? First of all, I'm surprised here it ever gets crossed. Is he, is he an X trader and getting cross markets? He didn't clarify. He's surprising. But um, yeah, obviously you're going to be co-located, so that should certainly help with that. But um, that's you know I, again that that's hard to really judge into. But there's no reason they should ever have a cross market in the first place. Yeah. So let me talk about like, uh, you know, outside of Chicago, outside of CME, like Urex or whatnot. How does that change with this model? Are you still going to have like Urex gateways or or not? Well, yeah, obviously we'll have gateways, but we're going to manage them all internally with the ASP. So. Okay. So like, you, sorry. Ahead, so you, so your, your cloud provider, you know, Amazon or whoever, you're going to, it's, it's going to be, you're going to have them both like Chicago and Europe or something like that for latency, I guess. Yeah, it's a, it's a multi redundant model. We'll have cloud access globally all over the place. Got it. Okay. Okay. I don't see too many other questions, so um, let me just ask. You, you mentioned. Or go ahead, Stephanie. I was just going to say that um, I just have now here on the screen. If you're still sharing our screen, is uh, yeah. The website where you can find a little more information. And then at the bottom, uh, you can put your email address in there, and you can go to this link if you want to try. You know, be a beta tester. We Obviously, we, we won't be taking everyone, and certain criteria will have to be met, but this is the website up here, Trading Technologies slash Product Initiatives, Products Next Trader, so um, just okay. to inform the users. Now. Sure. Okay, and you said that's going to open up probably in the next uh, two months or so, start doing that? Correct. Okay. You can sign up now. Right, right. <laughs> you can sign up now. We're looking to evaluate as many customers as we can. Right. Get as wide a, wide a swap across the industry as we can to ensure that we've got useful right. feedback from all different areas. Right, sure. Okay, so what is the best way for anybody that's going to be watching this as a recording sometime later? If they have questions for you, is there a, a preferred way to get those questions over to you guys? Yep, they can just email nexttrader at tradingtechnologies.com. Uh, I'll put it on this. I'll make sure it gets on this page as well. But it, it's on. If you sign up for the beta, it's on there. But it's next trader okay. at tradingtechnologies.com. Okay. Awesome. So hopefully, when you guys get a little bit closer, you can come back and uh, show us a little bit more detail. I'm I'm very interested, and I know a lot of people are. So uh, the final question that I don't think anybody asked is when is this going to be released? Beta is in two months. So what are you targeting? We're hoping for an end of uh, end of the year, 2015. Yeah, we, okay. we we hope to have a production release by the end of the year. But again, we're working with a very with a very limited product where it'll be stripped down. All the functionality you see in XTrader right now will not be in there. Got it. But our initial target group is really prop shops, so we'll have all the functionality you would generally find for proprietary trading. Okay. So, are you starting over? Is this like Next Trader 1.0? 
what do you mean? Well, I mean, it's you know, it's it's a it's a new brand, right? I mean, I understand yeah. it's whole new code. So uh, when you say it's it's kind of simplistic at launch, it's kind of like a 1.0 in that sense, instead of you know X Trader 8. <laughs> right. You can call it. You could say that. Yeah. yeah you, you you can say that certainly. So you build the base, and then you're going to listen to feedback and start adding the other features that people are that are wanting and roll those out, I guess, next year sometime. You're exactly correct. As part of the flexibility we have, where it'll be a very iterative product, we'll be able to actually add functionality much more quickly than we could in 7X. The turnaround time, the turnaround time is days now as opposed to weeks when a change has to be made to the software. Right. And like that alluded to, the first, the first market segment, the segment that we're, attach, that we're attacking is the proprietary markets. Um, once once the, those traders deem the product viable um, in terms of a production sense, we will release it and then we can go on and, and satisfy the needs of the additional market sectors such as the, the FCMs, the, uh, the banks, and, and the different brokerages themselves. Right. Okay. All right, guys. It sounds good. I appreciate your time today and, and giving us an overview and everything. And uh, uh, I'll post the recording of this sometime later today. If anybody has questions that did not get answered, you can email tt at nexttrader at tradingtechnologies.com. All right, guys. Thanks. I'll see you in a couple months for some more details. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you, Mike. Sure. Bye.